Everyone, good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's program, Science Spoilers Jurassic Park. My name is Denise Hernandez. I'm the program manager with the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, or C2ST. First, a very big thank you to The Hideout for partnering with C2ST and allowing us to host our program here tonight. Yay. Please get some ice cold drinks and remember to tip your bartender. The Chicago Council on Science and Technology, uh, our mission is to inspire and engage all segments of society about science and tech and their contributions to society. We're delighted to be entering our 15th year of offering science and tech programs, such as this one, to the public. To ask questions, visit c2st2.cnf.io for answers after the presentation and visit c2st.org to learn more about our upcoming programs and to donate. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with The Hideout. Thank you again. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Eric Gorsak, today's speaker. Very briefly, you can learn more about him at c2st.org or c2st2.cnf.io. Dr. Gorsak is an assistant professor of anatomy at Midwestern University who conducts research into dinosaur paleontology. After grad school, he was a researcher at the Field Museum and worked as one of the scientific, scientific consultants for the traveling Field Museum exhibit, Antarctic Dinosaurs. He has conducted paleontology fieldwork in Tanzania, Kenya, Madagascar, Antarctica, Missouri, and Utah, and has described and named several new dinosaurs. Wow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Gorsak. Dr. G, I'll hand it over to you. Should I use this or can I use? Yes, okay, great, awesome. Cool, thank you all for being here and thank you for everyone that's online too, looking and watching for today's program. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Eric Gorsak, I'm so excited. Uh, how many people here love Jurassic Park? Yeah, hopefully everyone, right? And how many people love dinosaurs? Yeah, great, this is gonna be great. Um, cool, so uh, this is gonna be an interesting talk. Um, this is kind of like, it's. Uh, I like the movies a lot. And it formed a lot of how I liked dinosaurs as a kid, uh, which I'm sure like a lot of kids my age probably did as well. Um, but this is more or less uh, kind of a different approach, kind of like a historical science, right? How did the field of paleontology kind of influence Jurassic Park? How did Jurassic Park kind of get stuff from what we knew in paleontology at the time of the movies and that kind of relationship between them? So this should be a fun little talk. I had a lot of uh, fun just kind of like re-watching all the movies and just like taking a lot of detailed notes. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Whoops, uh-oh. <laughs> They're coming in through the glass. Um, Drags Park though, right? So cool, so uh, I wanna talk, so I'll start off with like part one of my talk. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from Ian Malcolm from The Lost World. Ooh, ah, that's how it all starts. Then later just running and screaming. So this is kind of the uh, kind of the precursor to the movies, right? We've known about dinosaurs since about the mid 1800s. Um, things didn't really get going for paleontology until probably about like a century later. So in between that time, there was a lot of cool ideas concerning these dinosaurs, right? These weird animals that people started digging up. And a lot of these earlier kind of like drawings of these artistic expressions of these skeletons kind of capture some things about it. Uh, here's some Charles, Nart, uh, Charles Knight from about like a century ago. More active dinosaurs, more playful, whereas others kind of look more derpy, kind of more sluggish, something more like kind of like lizards today. They're not really doing anything active. They're just kind of, you know, just being bums waiting for the environment to warm up and do stuff. So that's kind of reflected in the art of the history of dinosaurs. And so this is also reflected in also the media, the movies that we are, you know, might be familiar with. One million years BC from the 60s, the land that time forgot. Uh, one of my favorites is Baby, <laughs> uh, Secret of the Lost Legend. But all these dinosaurs have more or less become kind of like movie monsters in a way, right? Their kind of representation is just kind of just like not really scientific, right? Until, you know, a certain movie came along in 1993. Um, oh yeah, sorry. There's a nice little gift there. Gertie the Dinosaur, one of my favorite like 1914 little short flicks. One of the first, I think it's the first animated movie, but it's pretty cute there. But I want to flash forward and really talk about the field of paleontology that's about to set up when Jurassic Park hits the films uh, in 1993. And so this period in dinosaur paleontology after, you know, so a couple of decades of kind of like 
kind of in the doldrums, a little bit slow on the front. Uh, there was this thing called the dinosaur renaissance, and this happened uh, in the 1960s through the 1970s. Uh, this is uh, kind of started by this one paleontologist called John Ostrom. He's the guy on the left. And uh, he discovered this really cool dinosaur uh, back in 1969 called Dionychus. So here's that Dionychus there. Should look familiar to people that loves Jurassic Park, right? So this is kind of that kind of proto-raptor that's going to inspire the, uh, the movies. And a student of John Ostrom, I should also mention, is Robert Bacher. He's this guy on the right. Uh, he was a student of Ostrom, and together they push forth these kind of, kind of, some of these ideas have been revisited, but really pushing forth that dinosaurs are actually active and warm-blooded animals. Instead of these kind of cold-blooded, sluggish animals, um, they also came back to some early ideas that birds are, in fact, dinosaurs. This was still kind of a kind of idea that was still contentious up until fairly recently, until the past couple of decades when we we're like, no, birds are definitely dinosaurs. And that they were like more sophisticated animals than we kind of like let them on to. So the dinosaur renaissance just introducing dinosaurs, active, warm-blooded, doing cool stuff. Another thing to kind of setting the, the kind of tone for Jurassic Park before it debuts is that we have this new idea on the dinosaur extinction. For a long time, it was a mystery of like, why did this entire group of animals go extinct? And it wasn't until 1980s, uh, the Alvarez hypothesis, father son duo, proposed that an asteroid impact killed the dinosaurs, which is very frightening, this kind of Armageddon type event killing off the dinosaurs. It kind of re Reignite, uh, reignited uh, interest in what killed the dinosaurs and can that happen again? So really basically, when you look all over the world about 66 million years ago, uh, there's this really cool layer in rock uh, along the KPG boundary between the age of dinosaurs and the age of mammals where there's a bunch of iridium. You find that all over the world, specifically at this point in history uh, within the rock record. And you only find iridium in extraterrestrial rocks or sources. So that's kind of, uh, kind of leading on this whole uh, asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. And it wasn't until 1991 with the Chuxalop crater uh, in Mexico off the Yucatan, where they found like a crater that fit the description that killed the dinosaurs. So in the 80s, we have this new interest in kill or what killed the dinosaurs. And then finally, we also have like computers that finally developed in the 1980s. And we have these computational algorithms to figure out relationships of animals. And it slowly trickled into dinosaurs uh, and other extinct animals. So using computers to figure out the relationships, kind of like uh, we figured out they're all related to one another. Uh, previously, we thought different dinosaur groups may have belonged to different other groups. They weren't all just one branch on the tree of life. So in the 80s, we had this kind of computer revolution uh, in terms of research in dinosaurs and how they're related to one another. Now, I really love this graph. So what we're seeing is the uh, amount of named dinosaurs through time. And right before the Jurassic Park trilogy, right before 1993, here's that dinosaur renaissance. There's that little bone wars, which there was a lot of dinosaur interest out west towards the late 1800s. Then kind of chills out a little bit. A lot of world, there was like two world wars going on there, so there wasn't much paleontology going on. But once again, once we get into the 60s and 80s, we have that dinosaur renaissance, a new interest in dinosaurs as active animals. We have that interest in extinctions. We have that interest in computers. And you can see the, the amount of named dinosaurs is increasing right at the time Jurassic Park came out. So I really like this idea that Jurassic Park was the right movie at the right time in terms of, you know, presenting a modern take of dinosaurs to the general public, which I would say it probably was successful, right? There's a lot of iconic imagery with those dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. So Jurassic Park, right movie at the right time. The Renaissance is happening. We have computers figuring out dinosaur relationships. The asteroid impact is kind of sexy new kind of like ideas about how things go extinct. And we have this kind of global paleontology taking place as well. A lot of dinosaurs I've worked on were discovered in 1993. So it's just really writing this crest of scientific reignoration, uh, re I can't even say the word, uh, interest into dinosaurs right at this time. So that's kind of the prelude. So let's go ahead and get into part two. Welcome to Jurassic Park. So Jurassic Park came out in 1993. 
Um, so this is introducing how we do modern dinosaurs in film and technology or film and entertainment. So there's a lot of like, as I was watching these films, I was trying to get like, what are the, some of the themes they're getting at with the research and how are they implementing it into the movie? And there's a couple things I've noticed. They're really hammering this point of warm blooded dinosaurs. Uh, birds are dinosaurs. They're really intelligent animals doing cool stuff. And of course they do move in herds. There's a couple of quotes early on in the movie that I really like. So this is how we're getting to the general public of introducing the idea that birds are dinosaurs. And this is fairly early on in the movie. Um, Dr. Grant looking at that x-ray of a velociraptor in Montana. Velociraptors are not from Montana, they're from Mongolia, uh, which is first off, first mistake. But what Grant is saying using Velociraptor and Dionychus, that dinosaur I talked about earlier by Ostrom Discovery, uh, that there's a lot of commonalities with birds. Their pubic bone is turned backwards, is one of the hip bones. Uh, they have a bunch of uh, air sacs and hollow um, uh, openings in their vertebrae, just like birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. Uh, and then also Tim is kind of like showcasing that kind of ignorance of the, the public, or at least naivety of the public. I'd be like, <laughs> you think they, you know, do you really think birds turn into bird, or do you really think dinosaurs turn into birds, Grant? Uh, something along those lines that Tim's like, they don't look like birds to me, which to be fair, true at the time. So when we talk about birds and the fossil record, up until about Jurassic Park, we had Archaeopteryx, discovered in 1861. It's this really bizarre animal that has bird-like traits and also lizard-like traits. So scientists weren't really quite sure if it was really dinosaur, bird, or some sort of weird thing in between. Funny enough, after Jurassic Park 1993, the first feathered dinosaur was discovered in uh, 1996. I should say non-avian dinosaur. Archaeopteryx is the first bird, technically. So we have Sinosauropteryx right here. This is a beautiful specimen from 1996. You can see how you have the impressions of the feathers running along its tail and backside. A couple years later, in 1997 and 1998, we find new species of dinosaurs with feathers. So this is kind of like, a, hey, dinosaurs might really be, or birds might really be dinosaurs with these cool discoveries. Um, there's a lot of cool moments in the movie as well, uh, kind of showcasing them more of these like animals instead of monsters, all these little details. Uh, one of my favorites, like figuring out how to open doors, <laughs> the Brachiosaurus sneezing, having to deal with sickness. Uh, one of my favorite things is the pupil reflex of the T-Rex, right? There's these little tiny magical moments that really show dinosaurs as animals rather than monster movies. And also another good one is the Velociraptor exhaling warm air on the window, showcasing that they're warm-blooded instead of cold-blooded. And of course, also another favorite, the little thinking toe tapping of the Velociraptor in the kitchen scene. And of course, <laughs> They do move in herds, a classic quote. And we do have evidence that dinosaurs live in herds. There's all kinds of mass death assemblages, a whole bunch of dinosaurs dying at the same time. You really get that when they move in groups. Um, so yeah, and then also here's another thing about birds. They flock like birds. Uh, they're flocking this way. Um, really driving home the point that birds are dinosaurs within Jurassic Park. Um, even the timing of Velociraptor, right? So Velociraptor is really the size of a turkey. Like, I could take on a Velociraptor, I think, right? Just kick it a few times, it'll fly away, like, whatever. But the, di but the Velociraptors in the movie were quite large, right? Mommy, like, like a six-foot turkey, another quote from the movie. Uh, so they're kind of big for Velociraptor and what we knew for raptors at that time. But the same year that the movie came out, we have Utah Raptor discovered in Utah that's actually about the size of the raptors in Jurassic Park. So the movie, I don't want to say predicted, but it definitely uh, matched a profile to a real dinosaur that was just about to be named and discovered in the same year that the movie came out. So as a whole, I think Jurassic Park did a really good job of kind of creating a modern take of dinosaurs at 1993. So we established that there's modern dinosaurs, they're active, they're warm-blooded, they're doing cool stuff. This idea that birds are dinosaurs, I'm really gonna hammer this point on, just birds are dinosaurs, and a bunch of kind of contemporary paleo ideas. So you did it, you crazy son of a bitch, you did it. <laughs> but also there's some weird things that they do. Uh, dinosaurs don't do this. This is a mammal thing, being able to rotate your wrist like this, pronating and supinating. They're more like off to the side like this. Think of like a bird flying. So they don't really have that movement. So if you do this, you're doing it wrong, do this. 
Um, vision based on movement, we know T-Rex had a really good sense of smell, a good idea of like vision, a little bit more acuity than we would think. And of course, the spitting in frills is more of an artistic licensing for the Dilophosauruses. But beyond that, the whole gist of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, I argue, is a really good modern take on dinosaurs. So the next question then is the lost world. How do you expand upon that, right? You already established this kind of uh, dinosaur mindset for the public. Can you explore other things with that? Um, so as watching throughout Lost World Jurassic Park, there's a lot of themes about dinosaur behavior, a lot of things about family and social structures, and nesting and parental care. And a large part of that comes from the scientific advisor for the Jurassic Park series, and that's Dr. John Jack Horner. He was the scientific consultant for most of the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies. Um, he was also the model for, uh, for Dr. Grant. I'm sure you can see the resemblance between the <laughs> both of them. But his ideas and his take on dinosaurs is kind of a good uh, uh, allusion to Dr. Grant in the books and the film. Uh, he did a lot of study on dinosaur nests, growth, behavior, and their social structures. Uh, he even named a dinosaur Myasora. So Sora is the feminine version of Saurus. So this is the good mother lizard, in which case it, it there it is right here. Nice little kind of duckbill-like dinosaur. And it's found with babies inside their age, uh, inside their eggs. So really cool find for the time, suggesting that dinosaurs had some sort of nesting parental care. And he was a big proponent on these kind of ideas for dinosaurs. And we see that in the Lost World Jurassic Park. We see the, uh, oh, these are supposed to be moving. Uh, but we see early on in the film, uh, Julianne Moore's character is petting a baby stegosaurus. The parents get pissed off and start swinging their tails. Uh, we also have the Tyrannosauruses. Uh, fighting and looking for their young. Uh, the good guys kind of take and kind of heal a broken leg of that baby T-Rex, but the mom and dad go hunting and want their baby back. And at the end, the bad guy is being feasted on by the baby T-Rex. So there's this kind of cool parental take, these ideas uh, that dinosaurs were nurturing social animals within Jurassic Park, the lost world. And that's cool because, whoops, oh, now, now it's moving. Uh, that's cool because right around that time, 1995, two years earlier to the Lost World Jurassic Park, we have this really cool find right here. This is a Oviraptor. Uh, it was found with the eggs. It's actually nesting. Uh, it was found with its own nest and eggs brooding. Um, original specimens thought it was actually stealing those eggs, hence its name, Oviraptor, egg thief. But really, those were the eggs of its babies, or its uh, soon-to-be babies. So this kind of shows, once again, the nesting parental behaviors of dinosaurs. And also makes a little cameo in Jurassic Park, or Jurassic World Dominion. We also find a lot of nests and clutches of eggs uh, between like the, the parents and those eggs uh, with Truodon in 1997. So once again, good timing with the movie. We also have some uh, Sarah Harding, the played by Julianne Moore. She's the actual, she's the only paleont, well, she's not the only paleontologist. She's the main paleontologist in the film and she studies behavior. And she's really on this kind of driven to show that dinosaurs were parental uh, kind of animals uh, taking care of their young. So there's a couple of quotes here for that. Once again, those T-Rexes, a big plot point is those, the mom and dad T-Rex really want their young T-Rex back from the good guys after healing its leg. Um, uh, I do have this movie clip, but kind of keep it short <laughs> uh, or just skip it. Basically, here's Robert Bacher and that guy from Ostrom Student, once again, proponent that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, kind of have a little, kind of a frenemy relationship with Jack Horner. He's actually in the film. You can kind of see the resemblance between Bacher and Burke right here. He gets eaten in the movie as kind of a joke from Jack Horner. Anyways. <laughs> I thought that was a nice little Easter egg to throw in there. Oh shit, there we go. If you go to 1 minute 34 on that. Carnivore? Yeah. No, no. Herbivore, late Cretaceous. You could go to minute 135 or 134, please. Yeah, I had a timestamp at the beginning there. I'm sorry. I'm bad with the YouTube links. Solid bone. I'm careful. See the packing. Brontosaur. By moving the baby Rex into our camp, we may have changed the adults to seed territory. The what? Why they persisted in destroying the trailers, and I'll feel they have to defend this entire area. That's not the problem. What is? What is the problem? 
Velociraptors. Really? Wait, wait a minute. What's that? Veloso Velociraptor. Carnivore. Pack hunter. About two meters tall, long snout, binocular vision, strong dexterous forearms, and killing claws on both feet. And the Rex may continue to track us to if they perceive a threat to themselves or to their infants. No, no, you're wrong there, Dr. Harding. We'll lose them once we leave their territory. No, don't bet on it. Tyrannosaurus got the largest proportional olfactory cavity of any creature in the fossil record, with the exception of one. Right, uh, uh turkey vulture. Could, uh, scent up to 10 miles. Right. So, very thrilling, but I say we should push on to the village. Okay, you can turn it off now. Thank you. That's my favorite scene in the entire movie. Actual debate between two paleontologists. Very riveting if you're not a paleontologist. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. And once again, Burke, supposed to be Bonker, and he dies later in the movie. So that kind of moves us to uh, the next one, uh, which is going to be Jurassic Park 3, which came out in 2001. And uh, this one kind of slips a little bit. You lose that Spielberg magic. But a couple of paleo themes I did pick up on here was that uh, the use of 3D technology, communication between dinosaurs, they kind of addressed the feather thing now that we know dinosaurs had feathers, and of course, Spinosaurus. So in the movie, like very early on, they have this really cool thing, the rapid prototyper, where in the field, they have like the 3D scan of the Velociraptor and they prototype the nasal cavity of the Velociraptor, which is true. This is something that we paleontologists definitely do now. We scan our fossils and we can also 3D print them. Here's a fossil I'm actually working on in my lab. That's me holding a 3D print of the real fossil in Germany. So we do do that. And so this is a kind of a cool kind of foreshadowing how prevalent it's gonna be in paleontology. We scan a lot of things in paleontology. That we now do all kinds of cool modeling. Uh, we can see the stresses through bite forces in the skulls of various dinosaurs. We can do the endocasts, which is basically where the brain resides inside the skull. And we can look at the different proportional sizes of the different brain areas to kind of get an idea of how these dinosaurs may have behaved grossly. This which is why we know T-Rex has a really good olfactory, a good sense of smell because there's a large part of the brain dedicated to olfaction uh, for T-Rex. We can also do some modeling of like limb movement and musculature reconstructions. And of course, vocalization. There's <laughs> in Jurassic Park 3, you have the raptors talking to each other, but also this weird dream sequence where the raptor says, Alan. It's a really weird, bizarre, but classic scene. But this is kind of based on, here's some uh, duck-billed dinosaurs, Lambiosaurines, do really cool stuff with these crests, with their nasal cavities, that there were some studies looking at what kind of notes could they produce. A very trombone-like effect, I think it was tuned to like a B flat. But we also have uh, some cool things where we have uh, birds uh, preserved, or fossil birds preserving this really cool structure called the syrinx. Uh, which is where the split between your, uh, the, your two lungs occur and it helps vibrate right there to produce notes on top of the vocal cords and producing uh, noises up here that we're used to. So it's able, so birds, some birds can produce two notes at once. And we have fossil evidence for that. So we have some idea, a little bit of vocalization with dinosaurs to an extent. And then uh, Dress Bar 3 kind of acknowledges feathers. You kind of see these dumb quill things on the head of the Velociraptors, but like, at least it's an attempt. Um, and then finally, intelligence. Uh, they really do, like, the raptors are really smart. They set up a trap by, here's Udesky. They kind of maim him, trying to lure everyone down from the trees, but they're aware that it's a trap. So, yeah, there's a little bit of some play there with dinosaur intelligence with Jurassic Park 3. And of course, with Spinosaurus in Jurassic Park 3, they portrayed it as an aquatic animal. But at that time, we didn't know much about Spinosaurus. So this is kind of a foreshadowing of the paleontology community. Uh, back in the mid-2010s, we found more specimens of Spinosaurus and became this really weird and bizarre kind of semi-aquatic dinosaur. So Jurassic Park 3, they were right in terms of like kind of the habitat and behavior, but wrong on the reconstruction. You can see how it has these dumb short limbs and really paddle-like tail. So the Jurassic Park trilogy kind of set what our modern take on dinosaurs and pop culture really are. So you can see, basically you can see that influence in various dinosaur movies since Jurassic Park trilogy, Land of the Lost, King Kong, all take those ideas.
And after Jurassic Park, like I said, it came in at a perfect time in paleontology. We are now in a new golden age of paleontology. This is the rest of the graph. Look at, this is the amount of named species of dinosaurs within like the past 10 years. It is just taking off and skyrocketing. We know so much more about dinosaurs uh, in part to a more uh, interest into the field. It's more global, uh, working with people from all over, all six continents, seven continents too. Um, so it's really grown into this really large field uh, in the past, like since I started being a paleontologist. We also know this is very useful for movies of dinosaurs. Uh, we kind of have an idea of what dinosaurs look like through their feathers. Uh, they preserve these really cool structures called melanosomes, and we can see that in modern birds. So we can compare modern bird melanosomes with those in the fossils to estimate what colors the dinosaurs are. And this kind of breakthrough, we have an idea of kind of the patterns of the colors in dinosaurs. So this is kind of good information to have if you want to reconstruct dinosaurs. Um, yeah. So Jurassic Park, pretty good. Um, but then part three, just to end it, uh, I love this quote. Dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. What's left of them is fossilized in stone. The actual scientists spend years to uncover. What John Hammond and InGen, Jurassic Park, uh, created are theme park monsters. Nothing more, nothing less. And this is where the Jurassic World movies kind of like falter in my opinion. Um, so in the science themes of like Jurassic World, they play more on like animal captivity, uh, more on animal exploitation and really drive home to genetic modification and hybrids that kind of been alluded to. And they kind of ditched the whole paleo part in a way. There's no paleontologist in Jurassic World uh, by 2015. Uh, so basically, we just become a monster movie uh, with Jurassic World, right? We're not treating them as animals. You can see this like, this is just unnecessary. <laughs> a, a, a pterosaur dropping the babysitter into a mosasaur's mouth is just gratuitous. Like, what does that serve? We also have like, <laughs> it's basically a four-way monster battle royale at the end of Jurassic World, right? So like, what's going on with Jurassic World? It kind of just kind of forgot what Jurassic Park, the original trilogy did in terms of kind of bringing these animals to life. Um, so really, it did do the yes and approach. Like, okay, we now have a park in Jurassic World, a fully formed park, and it's uh, really looking at the captivity and exploitation of the animals. And the director, Colin Trovero, I think he said it's like, you know, he watched Blackfish and kind of would bring in those ideas for Jurassic World. And then came Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. It's just a disaster movie and a monster movie. So there's really not much, once again, paleo-wise, kind of grounding some of the, the, the behavior of the dinosaurs. Um, but it does bring in this idea of volcanic extinctions and, of course, human cloning, more animal exploitation and genetic hybrids. So one of the big plot points with Jurassic Park Fallen Kingdom is that the whole island is just blowing up from a volcano. So why? So they need to destroy the island somehow, right? An unexplained volcano destroys the island. That's cool. But to be fair, during this time in Paleo, I talked about the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. There was actually an alternative uh, idea. These volcanoes in India called the Deccan Traps uh, lasted for, you know, a couple million years prior to the end of the age of dinosaurs. And there's also been studies looking at or asking that what if dinosaurs were already declining in their diversity? They were already on their way out for extinction. And then the asteroid came in and just did the one-two punch to finish it off. So that's kind of the kind of idea I kind of grabbed from Fallen Kingdom with this volcano, because this has been a topic of debate the past decade, decade and a half in paleontology. What really killed the dinosaurs? Were they slowly going extinct due to climate change with these volcanoes, and then the asteroid finished them off, or was it just all the volcano or all the uh, asteroid? It's more towards the asteroid. So that's kind of what I pulled from <laughs> Fallen Kingdom. But otherwise, it's just a monster movie with these weird hybrids. Kind of cool hybrid, but it's still a monster movie. And then, good lord, Jurassic World Dominion. <laughs> Has you, have you guys seen it yet? Don't worry, I had that many spoilers. Uh, but it's such a fan service movie, just to, it's just the last one. Um, they do introduce like dinosaurs in the snow, which is kind of weird, but you need to be warm blooded to live in the snow, right? In very high latitude kind of cold environments. 
And that's true. We find dinosaurs in high latitudes that lived in cold environments. So at least they did acknowledge this growing interest in polar dinosaurs. Uh, Prince Creek Formation in Alaska, there's so many cool dinosaurs coming out from there that all lived during the uh, wintertime and had adaptations in their bones to show that they adapted to cold environments. We have a whole bunch of cool fossils from Antarctica as well. You can't get more cold than Antarctica, but yet we find dinosaurs living in Antarctica. Uh, and then finally with Jurassic World Dominion, they did acknowledge some things, some past mistakes. Um, these are some quotes, I don't have any clips from the movie, uh, but one of the characters who's in charge of this sanctuary, uh, he's quoted, we've brought back numerous species into its purest form, and I mean completely untouched genes. So like, that's supposed to be you know a nice pure dinosaur with feathers covering it. So now they're just like retconning the whole Jurassic Park lore by introducing purest forms, even though the whole point of the first movie is that there's missing DNA chunks and they have to fill it in with different animals and create hybrids in the first place. So I don't know how they're really reconciling that. Uh, and then there's also this, this is a placeholder image of another uh, paleo nerd dweeb as a kid. But one of the quotes is, Technically, birds are dinosaurs, genetically speaking. So at least Jurassic World Dominion is kind of acknowledging that it kind of ran the monster course and kind of want to fix or at least acknowledge those mistakes in the past. So with that, uh, oh, and they also finally put feathers on the dinosaurs as well, uh, in some cases more so than others. So ah, it tried its best, guys. So with that, if you really want to see dinosaurs, go look at birds. Those are living dinosaurs, right? Those are the inspirations for the raptors and whatnot in Jurassic Park, which I think is really awesome to think about. You're looking at dinosaurs as they fly above you, pooping on your shoulder, or just like singing in the morning. And then of course, going to a museum and looking at these skeletons in awe of these past living animals. And if you see more living animals doing stuff, the more you have a, a better imagination of the possibilities of dinosaurs from the past. So that's all I have. Thank you. So we can do like Q and A or chit chat. So yeah, awesome. Ooh. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorsak. We are very grateful for your expertise and enthusiasm. So we'll transition over to some uh, questions for Q and A segment. If you have a question in the audience, can you raise your hand? Can you come up here and ask your question. Yeah. Um. We wanted to know how old dinosaurs lived to be. How old dinosaurs lived to be? That's a great question. So um, yeah, it's a really cool field of like studying growth of dinosaurs. So how uh, the well, how do we even determine that, right? What we do is uh, take some limb bones, and much like a tree, there's these lines of arrested growth, right? So during the year, you have you know summer and fall and winter in terms of production, right? So in the summertime you grow because there's a lot more food available and in the wintertime you slow down. So you have these arrested lines of growth. So much like a tree, right? That's they grow and then stop, grow and then stop. We can see that in dinosaurs in their limb bones. And you have a good population of the different individual dinosaurs. So like here's a small baby velociraptor, here's a juvenile size one, here's an adult size one, we can then growth those lines to see how fast they grew and how old they grew. So it depends on the dinosaur. So like T-Rex, I think was about 30-ish years, um, about how old it got. Uh, some of the larger dinosaurs probably grew beyond that, so like maybe 50, 60 years old, whereas the small ones are gonna be much shorter in like, their duration of life. So like maybe 15 to 20 years. So it's also size dependent too. So it varies much like today's animals, right? So like whales, they live for a century, whereas you know, if you have a rodent this big, it's like a year or two or something like that, right? So just that just shows like how diverse dinosaurs really are. But that's a very long question for a very easy question, I guess. So, makes sense? Yeah, of course. Thank you. We have some really interesting questions from our online audience. Oh, cool. Um, are there any dinosaurs in Chicago? Are there any dinosaurs in Chicago? There's falcons, there's pigeons, <laughs> uh, all the birds that you see flying around in Chicago. Uh, but in terms of like, I guess, dead dinosaurs, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure there would have been, would have been? dinosaurs here, but we don't have the age rocks of dinosaurs in the Chicago area. I think the rocks here are much older than dinosaurs, so we just don't have the record for that. Sorry. 
Speaking of rocks, uh, another question from our from our virtual audience: How are the scans done? Many dino fossils have a high iron content. Uh, wouldn't the, wouldn't that limit the use of MRIs? That's a good question. Um, so we use uh, typically CT scans, so computer tomography, um, just like the CT scans at a hospital. We just plop the fossil on there and it scans it. Um, it's really cool. It feeds back different densities through the bone. Uh, you can also use it for if it's still encased in a rock surrounding it. If you need to do removal of rock and need to understand what you're going to get or run into. Um, but yeah, it doesn't usually have that much of a problem. Um, but yeah, typically CT scanners uh, to do it. Awesome. Are there any other questions in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello. Um, this might be like just about semantics, and I hope it doesn't come off that way. But like, I'm interested in like if dinosaurs were bore birds and birds are dinosaurs. Like, is that just like semantics, or like which is which, and like yes. why? Okay. It's much like. Uh, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Is that how that goes? Uh, it's a nested hierarchy is what it's called. So basically, um, all birds, every single bird, every single bird are dinosaurs, but not all dinosaurs are birds, right? So here's the family tree of dinosaurs, right? Triceratops, Stegosaurus, sauropods, theropods. Birds are coming off of one branch specifically, uh, along the theropods, your meat-eating dinosaurs. So all birds coming off of that one branch, but they're still on that larger branch of dinosaurs with more forms. So all birds, every single one are dinosaurs, but not every dinosaur is a bird. Okay. Make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, Thank sweet. you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for that awesome question. Any more questions in the audience? Yes. Hello. Uh, could you say a bit more about um, why the study of dinosaurs has apparently exploded in the last 10 years or so? Uh, that's, yeah. So that's <laughs> the explosion there. It's a good question. I think, I don't want to attribute it to Jurassic Park too much, <laughs> right? I know it was like the perfect movie at the perfect time, but uh, you can see that uptick slowly happening right before the movie came out. And I really think it's just uh, the advent of computers and just like more people interested in dinosaurs just kind of just grew and grew and just more opportunities for that to happen. Uh, like around that time, uh, much more global paleontology was happening. So like in the late 90s into the 2000s, like South America was a hotbed. Uh, like it still is to this day uh, for dinosaur paleontologists. Uh, same thing for China. Like the past couple of years or since they found those feathered dinosaurs just sparked a boom into research into those deposits of China, just producing all these cool feathered birds. So I just think like, yeah, it's just more opportunities globally. Um, and just, I don't know, I guess that's part of it. And just also computers help too, in terms of doing actual, like kind of number crunching analyses. Uh, we we're able to answer questions that were not being able to be answered before without those computers. So I feel like it's a lot of factors and I don't know. It's every time I like go on Twitter, there's like a billion people talking about dinosaurs or in the field. I'm just so surprised like how it's grown, but yeah, I don't know. People just love dinosaurs. Thank you. Someone online asks, what's the most interesting thing you've learned about dinosaurs in your career? Most interesting thing I learned about dinosaurs in my career? Oh boy. Ah, uh, I don't know. Like I really find, I don't really study it, but like the transition to birds is really cool in my opinion. Like a lot of things that we think of as bird traits, feathers, uh, hollow bones, um, just like some of their behaviors is not really exclusive to birds. We see some of those things in other dinosaurs. So what really makes a bird a bird is kind of a weird question. It's just really this really kind of fuzzy or I should say feathery kind of part of the dinosaur tree. There's no question about it, like how much that has really been like solidified in the past like couple of decades. I think it's probably the most fascinating thing. But yeah. Very fascinating. Any more questions in our audience? Yes. So you talked about dinosaurs having hollow bones, that they're birds, that they have feathers. Are Is it possible that some of these dinosaurs with hollow bones flew more than <gasps> we thought? That's a great question. Yes. Um, yes. Ish. So, okay, some di dinosaurs are closely related to birds that have the feathers and whatnot. 
probably could fly, right? So Archaeopteryx, the first bird and its kin, probably could like do like short-term flights and stuff. Whereas feathers, though, and hollow bones actually predates uh, flight. We find dinosaurs with those hollow bones and feathers that are not doing flight, which begs the question, why do you have feathers? Part of it could be for thermal regulation, help keeping your body temperature constant. Um, another reason is also display, like finding a mate or, you know, finding another person of your species, right? Um, so it's was, was kind of cool, like feathers predate flight. They got co-opted to fly. And these birds, the bird line dinosaurs, were kind of primed for flight, uh, inheriting those hollow bones, those air sacs, are very ancient within dinosaurs. Sauropod dinosaurs, your long neck dinosaurs, had them as well these air sacs to help kind of lighten the load and they were able to get super huge. So I hope that answers your question. Like those feathers and air sacs could be used for many types of things, but only that lineage of birds was like, hey, let's just use this for flight. We have it, so let's try it out. So yeah, good question. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Staying on the topic of feathers, bird feather, color, bird feather colors include elements of light refraction. Without that element, how do you determine the color of the feathers? Yeah, that's a good question. So the gist of like those colors of the feathers is looking at these little proteins that help make up feathers, right? And we can study modern birds with the coloration of their feathers and see what colors are actually produced by these things called melanosomes. And those melanosomes take on very different shapes and those shapes correlate to different colors. Roughly your blacks, browns, and reds. Uh, in some cases, you can get iridescence as well. So we just look at the fossil feathers and those preserved melanosome structures. It's really cool. You have to take a really awesome microscope to see them. But you can also do those dimensions of those melanosomes, compare it to the modern birds to see what color those feathers were. So yeah, basically the shape of these little tiny sausages and meatballs uh, within the feathers. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and a final question, what is your favorite dinosaur and why? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, uh, it depends on, oh my God. So my snarky answer is a barn owl because all birds are dinosaurs and they're just super cool. Uh, but in terms of non-avian dinosaurs, it's used uh, another cop-out answer is the one that I'm usually working on now. So I'm working on a dinosaur from Egypt. So currently it's my favorite dinosaur, but uh, I don't know, I was always partial to, uh, uh, Cryolophosaurus, which is this really cool meat-eating dinosaur from Antarctica that had this really cool crest on its head and it got the nickname Elvis. So <laughs> that one's probably one of my favorites, I'd say. But yeah, cool. Anything else? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, um, okay. alas. I want to give a final thank you to Dr. Gorsak uh, for sharing all your expertise. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all, thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you to The Hideout again for providing the space. And join us on June 30th for Being Latinx and STEM. We'll be joined by two awesome Latinx local speakers who will be speaking about their research and uh, life experiences in STEM. Please evaluate today's session at c2st2.cnf.io or please complete the surveys that are being passed out right now. To support more programs like this one, donate at c2st.org and sign up for our weekly newsletter to stay up to date on what's happening in STEM. Thank you so much again.